Hello everyone. Welcome to the Alternative Seafood Seminar. Before we start, uh, while we wait for others to join, please take notes of some of the instructions that we're about to show you uh, on the screen to support smooth engagement during this meeting. The event will be recorded and all attendees' videos and audios are switched off by default. The video will then be, uh, will then be made available on a YouTube channel. We'd love to keep this event as interactive as possible and therefore I encourage you, all of you to use only the questions box to submit questions and only the comments box to submit your comments. So, hello everyone and welcome to the first seminar of the University of Stirling's Big Fish series. This is a short series of interactive seminars in which we explore contemporary issues around seafood. The idea of the series is to, co is to connect aquatic foods with what we eat more generally. We want to support efforts to put seafood at the heart of food systems thinking. We'd like to thank World Fish as our co-hosts for this event on alternative seafood, where we ask, is it a, sustain a sustainable food of the future? I'm Dave Little, and I work at the Institute of Aquaculture, University of Stirling, on sustainability issues around seafood, and I'll be hosting today's event. Today, our panel will explore alternative seafood as an emerging food with the potential to help meet the growing seafood demand, which is, but, but, but which has attracted um, mixed reactions by a large range of stakeholders. We kick off firstly with a presentation based on some recent research work carried out by World Fish. Let me introduce you then to Malcolm Beveridge, who will be introducing the topic in today's seminar. Malcolm is an independent researcher and has had an amazing career in aquaculture and fisheries spanning 40 years. He served as acting head of aquaculture of the Food and Agriculture Organization UN, director of aquaculture at World Fish and director of the Scottish Government Fisheries Research Services Freshwater Laboratory. He's lived and worked all over the world, including the Philippines, Egypt and Zambia. He's highly respected academic, having established his career, first of all, at the Institute in Stirling, but also holding positions elsewhere, including the College of Fisheries University of the Philippines. Now let's enjoy his presentation, which will be followed by a short video of individual views of old seafood from around the world. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Malcolm Beveridge, and I've been asked to provide some background to today's discussion. I draw on a report that World Fish colleagues and I have just finished. Since 1960, world population has more than doubled. Seafood production, however, has increased more than fivefold. For the last, capture fisheries, rather, was the major source of increased supplies between 1960 and 1990. For the last 30 years, however, growth has come from aquaculture, which since 2015 has supplied more than half of all fish eaten. Seafood is an important part of a varied diet, a nutrient dense source of high quality proteins and essential amino acids, lipids and micronutrients. Seafood's an important part of the global food system. Future growth in seafood supplies, however, is unlikely to be able to meet needs in low income countries. And there are growing concerns about the environmental costs of our food, including seafood, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, overfishing, wastes, escaped farm plants and animals, and the spread of aquatic pathogens around the world caused by aquaculture. Farmed aquatic production is increasingly reliant on crop-based feeds raising issues around the nutrient content of farmed aquatic produce. Present food systems are increasingly viewed as unsustainable and vulnerable to shocks, including from climate change. There remain 820 million food insecure people. 
Many more, however, consume low quality diets that cause micronutrient deficiencies and contribute to rising incidences of diet related obesity and non communicable diseases. As a result, there's a paradigm shift in food and nutrition security thinking away from feeding people to nourishing people with sustainable diets. It is in this context that plant-based and cell-based seafoods are emerging as new sources of food. First, some definitions. I use the term seafood here to include wild-caught and farmed plants, fish, crustaceans and mollusks. I use alt seafood as shorthand for both plant and cell-based seafood. Plant-based seafood may or may not contain aquatic products such as algal oils or pigments. And last, cell-based seafood is based on cell culture and biotechnology. Plant-based seafood is made from an ever-widening range of ingredients. Soy, wheat, rice, mycoprotein, vegetables, seaweed, algal and plant oils. The aim is to produce products that capture the taste and texture of seafood. The nutritional value of the finished product is determined by ingredients. Plant-based seafood products can also be developed to have high dietary fiber content or fortified with vitamins or minerals or made gluten or soy free. Plant-based seafood products often include numerous ingredients, binders, colorants, preservatives, flavor compounds. A high degree of processing is sometimes involved. Producers, however, are conscious of and addressing these issues. Upwards of 20 companies have emerged to meet consumer demand. Products emulating shrimp, canned and raw tuna, fish fillets and burgers are already available in retailers such as Whole Foods and Tesco. And there's increasing attention from conventional animal source food companies and significant investment in fundamental research and new technologies. Cell-based seafood is different. It is based on the isolation and multiplication of stem cells or differentiated muscle, fat and connective tissue cells from aquatic animals. Cells are grown in bioreactors that regulate temperature, nutrients and dissolved oxygen and pH to optimize growth. Cells can then be harvested to make products like seafood burgers and fish fingers. With the integration of scaffolding such as collagen, fillets and other cuts that emulate the appearance and texture of conventional seafood products can be produced. Cell-based seafood production has many attributes that resonate with consumers. However, there are outstanding issues which include optimized and scalable production, and water and energy use. Note that cell-based seafood has yet to receive a product license. To consider how the plant and cell-based seafood sectors, sectors might grow over the next decade, we worked with IFPRI and World Fish colleagues to develop a couple of scenarios. Under our high growth scenario, plant-based seafood could contribute one or two percent of global seafood supplies by 2030. Cell-based seafood could contribute perhaps several times this amount. However, these figures come with serious health warnings. We were also tasked with identifying the key research questions to be addressed to evaluate the implications of the growing plant and cell-based seafood sectors for food and nutrition security, livelihoods and the environment in developing countries. We adopted a sustainable food systems framework. Positive values must be generated along three dimensions simultaneously, economic, environmental, and social. We reviewed the scientific literature and mass media. We held interviews and workshops with stakeholders and members of the development community. We developed a theory of change about how plant and cell-based seafood might impact poverty and hunger in order to identify key knowledge gaps. <clears throat> Some 50 research questions were initially identified. 
following stakeholder workshops. These were uh, condensed into six research questions of greatest relevance to World Fish's mission. How are markets for plant and cell-based seafood likely to develop in different regions? How can plant and cell-based seafood best contribute to food and nutrition security? How much employment is likely to be created and or lost in developing countries by the plant and cell-based seafood sectors? How can development of the subsectors be influenced to generate well-governed value chains that maximize societal benefits? How do the environmental impacts of plant and cell-based seafood compare with those of conventional seafood? And how can changes in conventional and alternative seafood production and consumption improve aquatic ecosystem health? The emerging <coughs> plant and cell-based seafood sectors are characterized by rapid innovation and a real sense of excitement about the possibilities. The sectors may develop in a number of directions. They may remain niche, catering to wealthier consumers who will continue to eat seafood as before, or they may become an integral part of a sustainable food system, contributing to food and nutrition security while relieving pressure on the environment and creating jobs. Our evaluation of the sectors on food and nutrition security, jobs and the environment was confounded by a lack of data and analysis. Provided with such data, <coughs> future foresight modelling outputs can inform discussions on where innovative investments could be used to maximise social, economic and environmental benefits. Over the past few months, we have had the privilege of working with a lot of amazing people who generously shared their knowledge and views with us. And we thank them all. And you too, for taking part today. Thank you. Um, perhaps we can now see the views from the field. We have a few perceptions and perspectives of uh, old seafood from around the world. Hi everyone, Liu Chong here. Now, alternative seafood good way to tackle sustainability issues and definitely adds new variety of food sources to the market and with vegan restaurants trending here in china if you could provide plant-based seafood that is nutritious tasty and has a pleasant texture i say you'll become very successful that's all for now stay safe and healthy i am not seeing an alternative as presented as relevant to the context i work in Alternative livelihoods and foods have been going on for decades for the poor. We had replacing fish in Bangladesh. We see amazing successes in Cambodia, largely because of tourism and FDI. Although the tourists and investors want more high value species of fish, complicated. Here's for hoping more successes in plant-based alternatives, as long as they don't chop down more forests to grow it I would be interested in replacing some of my fish consumption with plant-based fish as long as the texture, flavour and health benefits were similar to that of the fish that I was replacing. Um, I believe this would be a more eco-conscious option. I believe there's a market for it. I know that Quarren have fishless fish fingers that I have tried in fish finger sandwiches before. Um, from an environmental perspective, however, I would want to be reassured that any um, impacts of land use changes were um, thoroughly accounted for. Shifting to a plant-based diet has lots of benefits, not only for the environment, but also for our bodies. It stands to reason that alternative seafood should do the same thing. I think there's such a range of different things that can be done with different ingredients like seaweed. One of the things that we do in our household is our own take on the traditional fish and chips. Instead of using cod or haddock, we use tofu. And to give it that fishy flavour, use a bit of seaweed before coating the whole thing in beer batter. And it's absolutely delicious. I think alternative seafood holds a lot of potential. I think there's a lot of space to look at different types of ingredients, different types of recipes. Big thumbs up.
So that's great. Thank you for those views. Um, a lot of talk about taste and texture. Well, that's what food's about. Now we've had that interview I'd like to, overview, I'd like to introduce you to today's panel, who we've asked to address some of the key issues about alternative seafood. Carsten Krohn is managing partner and co-founder of Hatch, an accelerator of innovation in aquaculture. Hatch has invested in more than 30 companies and alternative seafood has emerged as an important component of their investment portfolio. They operate globally with offices in Hawaii, Norway and Singapore. Prior to funding, uh, founding Hatch in 2017, Carsten oversaw equity investments in various aquaculture, feed, health and production companies. Jen Lamy is Sustainable Seafood Initiative Manager at the Good Food Institute, where she manages their Sustainable Seafood Initiative. The US-based organization provided advice to companies and connects food scientists with other actors. They act as conveners of grant-making organizations, educationalists, and the private sector. Her background's in environmental economics and sustainable food systems, and she most recently worked on federal climate policy advocacy. Tara Garnett is Food Climate Research Network Leader at the Environmental Change Institute, University of, Lo University of Oxford. She's worked on food for over 25 years within both the NGO and academic sectors. A fellow at the Oxford Martin School since 2012, she's been a global advocate of low environmental impact food systems. Tara is part of the Wellcome Trust funded LEAP project. Joyce Canabo is a professor of human nutrition at Sequana University of Agriculture in Tanzania. She's been actively involved in nutrition research, focusing on developing nutrition interventions with, within communities. And Joyce has worked on developing and testing eco-nutrition guidelines, which support rural communities to best respond to challenges of food insecurity, lack of care, and poor environment. Nisha Mawala works on the Sustainable Aquaculture Program at World Fish and her backgrounds in agricultural engineering and sustainable food systems. Nisha's work with Malcolm Beveridge on the forthcoming report on alternative seafood. She's a graduate at UC Davis with interests in biological systems engineering. Lastly, but not least, Charles Ngugi is Dean of the School of Natural Resources and Environmental Studies, Karatina University in Kenya. He's over 40 years of experience in the fields of fish biology and aquaculture research. He's held senior positions in the Kenyan government, including fisheries secretary, and worked over the past 20 years as a consultant and advisor for many organizations promoting aquaculture. Apart from this, he's been a pioneer in fish farming himself. He has his own farm, and he's recently been honored as an unsung hero by Aquaculture Awards UK. So with that, there's your panel. Maybe we can move to start the panel discussion. And I'd like to kick off with the first question who I'm addressing to Carsten Krohn is, why should an investor be interested in old seafood? And might a trend towards this novel type of food undermine interest in conventional seafood? Thank you, Carsten. Thanks, Dave. Um, this is a really interesting um, presentation so far. So thank you for, for having me. Um, I think fundamentally, venture capital investors are always interested in investing in new technologies that have the potential to transfer an existing industry. And I think for alternative seafood, that is definitely the case. I do think we have to distinguish between cell-based and plant-based as fundamentally being different. Um, in, in, in its return profile, in its transformation potential, and it's in its um, time to market. And for Hatch, our, our mission, our underlying mission has always been to protect the ocean from overfishing through investing in sustainable aquaculture and making aquaculture the singular most effective option of producing seafood. And when alternative seafood came into play maybe a year and a half ago, we were also struggling to, 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 to look at how we want to deal with it. Is this something that falls within our realm or not? And that's why I'm so glad because we decided to go ahead and do that. Um, we made two investments in, in the space so far. And it's amazing key for me that uh, the University of Sterling as well as World Fish are also now, now dealing with it. So um, 
the fundamentals for us in our assessment look a little bit better for plant-based seafood because there's already existing supply chains that that are in place while for cell-based seafood that is not the case you have to basically invent everything from scratch so that means that in the short term and by short term i mean in the last in the next uh, five to ten years we expect the plant-based seafood industry to become potentially even mainstream and get to that one to 2% uh, market share that Malcolm was referring to in his graph. And I think that wh while I do think in, in, in this particular field, there is improvement needed processing side of raw materials on improving the taste of, of the products and the texture of the products. We, we've tried virtually every plant-based seafood product out there. There's not many that are good. We chose to invest in a company that called the Plant-Based Seafood Company. They have a plant-based shrimp, which does have this um, ability to, to mimic the taste of real shrimp perfectly. And um, so, but, but there's not that much good stuff out there. But still, I do think that plant-based seafood will have the potential to, to um, become a mainstream product and therefore also compete with um, conventional seafood in a, in a sense. Um, we are talking about very long time frames here and and um, different differences in an adaptation between western and and far eastern or other markets but i do think that it is something that eventually um could transform the the food chain one thing one last thing i will say is that um in in cell-based seafood and plant-based seafood we are also we are not keep competing we're competing against aquaculture but we're also still competing against against wild caught fish and that is something that the plant-based meats of this world don't have to do because it's clear that plant that that mass animal production of of cows and 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 pigs are unsustainable while for for aquaculture um that is not necessarily the case it's got a better footprint as you guys know than than pork and and um and cattle and therefore it might take a little bit longer for um, alternative seafood to to get a foothold as a mainstream product, but that that remains to be seen. Thank you, Carsten. Perhaps uh, I could invite Jen, Jen, to give some uh, response or some to add to that, please. Yes, thanks. Um, so first, I wanted to say that. Yes, cultivated seafood is definitely, or cell-based seafood is definitely a um, longer time frame. but did want to make sure that the audience knows that um, Singapore just approved for the first time uh, for sale cultivated meat. So they'll have cultivated chicken on the market um, fairly soon. So we're starting to see that, you know, slow transition to products that actually make it to consumers. Um, but I did want to emphasize Karsten's point about this long time frame. I think the really interesting thing about alternative seafood relative to other alternative proteins is that it's actually pretty clear that we'll have unmet demand for seafood on a global level um, unless some you know, serious innovation happens. So while alternative seafood could certainly replace some um, you know, demand for and investment interest in conventional seafood, um, this is also a very, very long term growth of a new industry um, rather than you know, some kind of rapid disruption of the existing industry. Um, so alternative seafood growing does not necessarily require a reduction in demand for conventional seafood, at least in the in the short term. Um, but also that unmet demand really gets to kind of the core of the question, which is that, you know, that trend along with, you know, amazing innovation in this space um, that's allowing for the creation of products that are getting a little bit better and better over time um, in terms of taste and smell and texture um, and can really uh, get us to the products that we love um, is really driving a new and very needed segment of the seafood market. So investors should definitely see this, you know, coinciding trends of a gap in supply um, and new in, uh, innovation opportunity as a way to kind of get in on the ground floor um, on this future of seafood. Thank you, Jen. Um, so that really leads into a question I'd like you to lead on, please, um, which is around in what ways would the growth of alternative seafood in the next decade help build a more sustainable and resilient food system? 
Yeah, so I think that the core theme that underlies much of uh, the advantage of alternative seafood is efficiency. So while plant-based cultivated and fermentation derived seafood as well, um, with those production systems, we're really just producing the end product that consumers actually want. So we're not wasting food, water, energy, land on you know bones and gills and fins and all of the other parts of the animal that are less desirable to the end consumer. Um, and not only that, but alternative seafood can be produced anywhere. So we don't need to you know send large fishing fishing vessels further and further away from these depleted depleted coastal fisheries. Um, and we don't need uh, to locate seafood production um, on or near fragile coastal ecosystems. Um, alternative seafood production really gives us the flexibility to produce what consumers want, where they want it um, more efficiently. And I should mention that, you know, both the social and environmental sustainability can be assessed more easily with alternative seafood because the processes are just easier to monitor um, and are shaping up to be much more transparent. Um, than a large segment of the conventional industry. And beyond the obvious advantages of introducing alternative seafood, um, instead of continuing to expand fishing and aquaculture, uh, the industry can actually you know, support other industries like sustainable seaweed farming uh, by creating a market for novel ingredients. So these ingredients can then be used to lend alternative seafood products their sensory and nutritional profiles um, that are expected by consumers and the alternative seafood industry can, you know, therefore create a predictable and, and robust market for something like seaweed. Um, so the producers can, you know, continue pr improving on all criteria um, with these new ingredients, novel processing techniques, um, and other, other innovation over time. And I wanted to finish by mentioning that resiliency is a big part of both the sort of environmental and financial story here as well. So if we think about market shocks, alternative seafood production can be ramped up and ramped down um, really quickly based on changes in demand. So we could even imagine a world where, you know, one species could be produced instead of another in a matter of hours with the same production um, system, just with tweaks in the process. And similarly, as the, as the climate changes, alternative seafood um, is, you know, pretty resilient to environmental shocks. So production doesn't reply, rely on the temperature of the water um, or the status of a fishery. So this precision and efficiency um, and the transparency that kind of shows that uh, affords the industry really the ability to make the most um, sustainable, responsible, um, and resilient way for us to, to ramp up seafood supply to meet growing demand. Thanks, Jen. That's great. Perhaps I could ask Tara to, to come on at this point and give her view. Hello, yes, um, these are, sorry, I'm just starting my video. These are, these are all good points and I would like to just sound a few notes of sort of so some questions and some notes of caution. Um, in my view, sustainability and resilience are not quite the same thing as efficiency. I think when it comes to the potential for aquaculture, uh, for all seafoods, there is the scope for greater efficiency but resilience is a broader term that encompasses uh, economic power, health, and broader environmental objectives. Um, I, I think some of the questions to ask are, who is going to profit from the development of all, all seafoods? And to what extent are these going to not be small, small scale producers and the people along the whole of the value chain. So I think, I think it's in where are these alt seafoods being developed at the moment? The answers are mainly in Silicon Valley in the States, other parts of the world, perhaps Israel and so forth. Um, so as it develops, it will be interesting to see how and if um, small, small, smaller players are actually going to benefit financially and in terms of their livelihoods. Um, I think the other, the other thing to say is that um, much has been made of the purported uh, health and nutritional aspects of these alt seafoods, um, you know, protein, protein, nutrient dense foods. But as we've seen with the first go ahead on this um, new um, uh, chicken, um, cellular chicken in Singapore and the first form it comes in is in a processed form and fried as a nugget so it's the package it's the saturated fat 
it's the salt. Um, there was a recent review of um, plant-based meat substitutes, so meat, not seafoods, but similar idea, um, and it compared them with its um, processed meat um, comparators, and it found that although these processed plant-based alternatives scored slightly better on the fat, um, on the fat content, they were A, lower in protein, but B, significantly higher in 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 salt so so it's all about how these are going to be produced and it's much easier to at the moment technically to produce it in a very processed form which you sort of disguise in batter than it is to have it as a kind of lean um lean fillet um, and i think we'll come on to the environmental impacts later on but i think there are questions around energy use that also need to be considered but i'll leave that for now Thanks, Tara. That's great. That's, uh, yeah, some words of warning coming in there. And uh, we're going to move on and build on that by asking Joyce how, in her view, can alternative seafood best contribute to food and nutrition security? And particularly with that focus on lower medium income countries. Uh, Joyce, I welcome your, your comment on that. Thank you very much, uh, Dave, uh, for having me uh, on this uh, webinar. Uh, okay, I've tried to approach this um, question by looking at the uh, by looking at the concept of food security, uh, and we know that uh, the concept of food security has four pillars, and this include availability, accessibility, utilization, and stability. So a food has to meet all these aspects in all these pillars. And looking at the alternative foods, I think uh, uh, and it has to be produced as from what we, we have already heard uh, in the first presentation, that there's effort to increase production. So if there's adequate production of alternative seafoods, then definitely that would contribute to food security. But then uh, I think I'd like to uh, raise a, uh, some caution here is about the cost benefit analysis of producing uh, alternative uh, seafoods. Um, it, we don't want these products to end up being very expensive for the low income uh, bracket of the population. Uh, we also need to understand how much should be produced to meet the nutritional requirements of these people. And what is the cost benefit of producing an equivalent nutritional value of this product to be able to uh, meet the demand and the requirements of consumers. Um, but also we need to understand as to what um, production system will be in place, especially for the cell-based uh, alternative foods, because I see that to be uh, a little bit challenging, especially for the low and middle income countries, because it's like a high tech kind of uh, production. And this might not be very, very uh, possible in our kind of setup. Uh, and what policies should be in place to promote alternative seafoods, because I see that is a challenge also. We are still grappling with agriculture and the policies as well as conventional um, uh, seafoods. So these are some of the aspects that we need to take into account when we deal with this. And then this uh, question of accessibility. Uh, from what we have heard in the presentations, uh, I think this system of plant and cell-based um, seafoods uh, lends itself to localized production schemes. We know that conventional uh, production of uh, seafoods is from large water bodies and uh, transportation to consumers can be very, very expensive. And uh, a lot of waste happens um, in the process. So flexibility of the system is something that is uh, like a positive uh, uh, attribute to this system because you can move to whatever area, even in remote areas, people can continue to uh, produce these alternative seafoods. Uh, so this will facilitate accessibility of these products in places where seafood is currently inaccessible and therefore probably ensure adequate intake by remote households. So in that way, we'll be uh, promoting accessibility to these products. But at the moment, uh, from the way the system 
system is operating, the products, is, the products are still very expensive for the low and middle income countries. Uh, another aspect about food security is utilization. And it has already been mentioned earlier on, it's about the question of taste and texture, as well as prevalence and knowledge and skills of food preparation. Uh, these are some of the aspects that really need to be uh, put in place, especially for the low and middle income countries. So here, I think we would need a heavy uh, like advocacy agenda to accompany the introduction of these foods. Uh, because, um, you know, changing from one test to another can be a, a little bit uh, tricky. So what I see here is that alternative seafoods create an opportunity to ensure a balanced uh, supply of nutrients and the ability to alter the profile to suit uh, requirements and therefore be able to attain food and nutrition security. But I do not see that happening in developing countries or low and middle income countries in the near future. And I think some of the presenters alluded to that. The issue of stability, this is an area that would ensure the sustainability of alternative foods in the food system. But we need to consider safety issues, especially of the plant-based seafoods. Someone mentioned about seaweed and my body was just in chills because I reacted terribly to seaweed. So I don't know how many people out there would uh, you know, react to such kind of, uh, kinds of foods. So these aspects of allergy or other reactions that uh, people experience, I think would need to be taken into consideration. But again, there's a question of rules and regulations, standards, certification and labeling. Uh, in addition, we need to assess the impact of this system on the environment and the other way around. So these are things that still need to be uh, looked into as we move transition and move transformation to these other alternative foods. Thank you very much for now. Thank you, Joyce. Um, we're going to move on swiftly now to uh, another question. And I'd like Tara uh, to think about if food production and diets known to contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental impacts, how's alternative seafood likely to compare with those of conventional seafood and other choices of animal source food? Tara. Yes, so I mean, I think the first thing to say is that within this category that we call conventional seafood and obviously conventional animal source food as well, there is a massive, massive range. And sometimes it depends on the animal type and sometimes it's actually on the management and the production system. So there is no amorphous conventional seafood or conventional um, livestock protein against which um, all seafoods can be compared. Um, studies as to the environmental impacts of these um, alternative foods, as well as the sort of plant-based substitutes, are few and far between. And so there's lots and lots of speculation and variation. What seems to be emerging is that some of these systems, depending on how it can be done, how it's done, can be quite high in their fossil energy use. Now, this needn't be a problem further diet down the line as and if countries start to decarbonize but that's obviously progress there is incredibly patchy and incredibly um, varied by different countries so i think the the energy costs of alternative um, seafood production need to be uh, borne in mind i think the other thing there's the indirect um, costs as well to consider and i suppose i call this the the kind of the rebound effect. Um, so to what extent are, is the production of alternative proteins, not just seafood, but also um, terrestrial animal proteins, going to substitute for conventional meat and seafood? And to what extent does it simply grow the market? If you look at the uh, plant-based proteins um, sector in a, in a country like the UK, where I'm from, where it's exploded, the R's have exploded. There are more and more plant-based processed offerings on the shelves any minute, but there are no signs that actual consumption of um, mainstream animal products are actually declining. So this can be seen as a way in which the, um, the food industry is simply expanding sales 
overall. So I think the substitution effect needs to be, that, that, that rebound effect needs to be borne in mind. And also um, our conventional, sea, uh, our alternative seafoods going to substitute for, um, you know, frozen shrimps or prawns or trouts or whatever it is that, that people are buying or, or something else that somebody might have been eating. And that could have been uh, some uh, less processed plant-based substitute in uh, a traditional diet, wherever it is in the world, whether it's in you know, Tanzania or the UK. So I think these sort of indirect environmental um, impacts do need to be uh, borne in mind. And I think, I think the other, the kind of the only other point I would make is that we need to, is to look at the, is to go back and look at the sort of nutritional profile. And obviously that's, that's already been um, well articulated to date, but we have to think about what is the purpose of the food system? And one way of uh, answering the question is to meet growing consumer demand. And the other way of looking at it is, is to nourish people effectively. Um, and the latter is more of a limits-based approach. So I think we have to think about um, how does alternative seafood fit into a framework in which the starting point is planetary boundaries and how we think about nourishing people within the context of those boundaries. And I think the role of plant-based um, and alternative seafoods can be very productive and very beneficial within that boundary framework. But if you're simply looking at it as a sense of this is the way the market are going, this is the way trends are going, we're not going to look at it from a broader systemic um, perspective which will require regulations and quite radical shifts in, in our expectations of what diets are, then I'm not sure that this necessarily constitutes a solution. But at the moment, everything is so speculative, and this long time frame is, you know, has been has been emphasised lots of times. So I think that the challenge is that we can make this whatever we want it to be, and and we have to look at it from this more structural perspective in order to ensure that we don't end up shooting ourselves in the foot. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. Um, yeah. This, it's complicated, isn't it? Let's move on uh, now and, and ask perhaps Nisha uh, to, to talk to the point about how could we assess and mitigate these, we've heard about these adverse impacts resulting from any growth in alternative seafood on those who currently depend on conventional seafood value chain. So, you know, how can we look at it? How can we understand it? How can we mitigate it, Nisha? Sure, thanks for the question, Dave. Um, so at this point, I think uh, it really comes down to data and documentation. I think it's been stressed a lot of times um, prior to, to now that we are kind of in this space where a lot of things are speculative and there's not a lot of on the ground data um, that, that's available. And so I think the first thing is, is data and documentation so we can actually understand you know, how the sector is evolving. Um, based on our research at World Fish, we, we really only expect alternative seafood to account for, you know, at most 8% uh, of the global seafood supply by 2030. Um, and this comes out to about 14 million tons, which is, which is not trivial and definitely, as Jen mentioned, you know, sort of starts that process of, of augmenting seafood supply to meet a growing demand. Um, but we, we don't foresee major shifts in the conventional seafood um, value chains. Uh, based on based on that estimate. We are, however, working with really limited data. Um, so there is just an inherent uncertainty associated with these estimates too. I think if we can sort of put together better data uh, about you know, production, consumption, trade, uh, inputs, uh, nutrient content, as a lot of uh, people have mentioned um, about alternative secret products, we can really uh, start to better understand how the alternative seafood sector is already interacting with the conventional seafood sector um, and how it will potentially interact with the sector but also how it may interact with other sectors um, the conventional meat sector uh, and so forth um, i think then then is the time that we can actually you know effectively plan for projected impacts uh, whether they be positive or negative 
uh, and then inform policy or other initiatives um, or other oversight to sort of minimize adverse impacts and, and maximize positive ones. And uh, just uh, to quickly bring back what Jen said, um, so I don't think that capture fisheries and aquaculture are on the decline, you know, at least not in the near future. Um, they will, however, change and have started to, uh, in many places already, to become, you know, more sustainable, more efficient, uh, more inclusive. I think over the course of our research, uh, I've had the privilege of uh, speaking to quite a few producers of alt seafood, and most of them acknowledge that alt seafood won't displace conventional seafood uh, entirely, that rather it's meant as a way to sort of help supplement supplies to uh, meet rising demand. And I think that if alt seafood can do this and, you know, within the planetary boundaries or within some sort of framework, um, this, it really may help with this transition towards uh, more sustainable um, and responsible seafood production. And I think, you know, the, right, the best thing we can do right now is really kind of establish um, and keep an open dialogue between, you know, stakeholders in the conventional and alternative seafood sectors uh, with research institutions and with governmental and intergovernmental organizations too. Um, I think this, you know, this cooperation is really essential to better understanding, you know, a broader set of implications that alternative seafood may have, um, whether we look at it as a novel sector uh, or a new food uh, or a potential alternative to seafood or meat. Um, and I think this dialogue will really, you know, set us up better to sort of address uh, adverse impacts before they arise or sort of implement the, the right uh, governance or oversight so that we uh, can sort of mitigate impacts uh, more effectively. Thanks, Nisha. That's great. Um, we've got tons of questions coming up in the Q&A uh, section of uh, the panel that you can read, but we're going to move and <clears throat> pick up on some of these questions now and address them directly to different members of the panel. And uh, Perhaps if I address a question to you, panel member, you can pipe up and, and, and address it. So the first one is, given that nutritional value of alternative seafood is diverse and may be different from conventional seafood, is there a need for clear labeling of products? Um, perhaps I could ask uh, Joyce to, 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 to talk to that one first of all. The issue of labeling, Joyce, how critical do you think it is uh, as these products start to enter the market? This will be very important, as I've already mentioned in my presentation, that uh, rules and regulations will really have to be very, very uh, important in, uh, in getting this uh, out into the market. So the issue of labeling would be very important to inform consumers, especially uh, on the, um, the level of nutrients that are contained in a particular product. Because with the uh, conventional, we know that is this fish from the, uh, the sea or ocean or pond, but to this uh, alternative seafood, then labeling would be very important to the details as to what is contained in that product to inform consumers as to what they are, are consuming and what would do uh, in case of anything, because that then would be like, if they react to a particular food, then we can trace to that labeling to know exactly what was contained and what might have caused uh, such a reaction to a, uh, to a consumer. So I think this is, this is very important and thank you for the question. In addition to nutritional value, but we also need to say exactly what else is contained, because I remember from, um, uh, Malcolm presentation that this is this will be like high and ultra processed foods uh, with addition of additives and all other chemicals. So that point of labeling would be very, very important. Thank you, Joyce. Um, I mean, someone's put up in the chat, uh, you know, um, this is exciting, the innovation around is exciting, but who control things, especially as multinationals are entering this market and out competing potentially locally produced seafood in lower income countries. 
will small scale manufacture ever be possible to maintain a mix of livelihoods? And I thought perhaps if Malcolm's available, he could talk to that and then maybe Carsten can follow up. Malcolm, I think you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Dave, could you repeat that question, please? Yeah, the question of who will, will local producers uh, be able to compete given the entry of multinationals? Uh, will locally produce seafood in lower income countries really be able to compete? And will small scale manufacture of these old seafoods, is that likely to become a thing? You know, was it possible and maintain a mix of, of livelihood outcomes? Well, um, first, they may be competing for different markets. So the uh, conventional seafood producers, small scale fishers, small scale farmers uh, could be targeting and are more likely to target their products for local markets to local markets. For uh, alt seafood, that is plant based and, and, and cell based seafoods, they may indeed be uh, uh, established by multinational companies. And there is a thing, or the, there are a number of questions here around food sovereignty and who has control over key elements of um, the, the uh, national food systems, regional food systems. But there are many different models. So first, yes, uh, small scale production is quite possible, although I'm not sure about the economies of scale here. There may be joint ventures between local uh, uh, um, investors and local producers, potential local producers rather, and uh, companies with an established track record and brand name, as we've seen with them, um, Western products, for example, in, in various parts of the country and also uh, 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 products coming from now from the south into Europe and uh, and um, so um, there's a range of models here and I think it's very early days but definitely um, this is something that uh, we need to consider uh, this whole issue around food sovereignty and how these products may be allowed or maybe uh, uh, um, encouraged to develop in the future. Thanks Mel. I, I mean Carsten you're, you know, you're funneling investment through to support this, this type of innovation. Are you trying to identify poorer countries, perhaps smaller scale uh, actors who could produce these products? Is that, is that going to be possible going forward or will it all be? So I, I, I think it's too, too, too easy to just say I see food. I think every time you have something that's potentially disruptive, and I would actually just say, that cell-based seafood is disruptive, while plant-based seafood is just a couple of order ma of magnitudes more efficient. Right. So every time you've got something that is disruptive, you've got an opportunity to change the status quo, also in terms of distribution, but you also have a risk of, for example, multinationals just completely um, you know, crushing those, the, the, the supply chain and, and further consolidating. So, for example, when I, when I talk about plant-based seafood, I'm always giving that example that I think 230 million tons of soybean are produced every year, and 98% of that goes into feed. If 98% if now would go into food directly, which is perfectly fine of doing, just in terms of its quality, all of a sudden you would see a massive decrease in pricing that would also um, affect smallholders just because it would be so much more efficient if it goes into plant-based seafood instead of feed. So um, I think I think we would have to look at this, um, you know, on a on a very much case by case basis. But I'm also convinced that this is a hype now, and I'm always also electric cars. Think about electric cars. In the 2000s at the beginning here in Europe and the United States, that was a big hype for a while, and then it went away. It went away for 15 years and now it's slowly becoming mainstream. And there's this consultancy, uh, American consultancy called Gartner. They have created what's called the Gartner hype cycle. I don't know who of you have heard of that. And it just shows the, the way that innovation usually evolves over time. Um, and I think this is what we're seeing here in terms, of, in terms of alternative seafood as well. It's a big hype now, it'll go away, but then it'll slowly come and climb up. And that is the time 
when we need to think about distribution and and smallholder farmers and and this kind of thing because this is when it really potentially be, gets significant market share and it significantly affects the status quo thanks thanks very much Carsten. jens i'd just like to uh, finally because we, we're running out of time here just briefly whether you can talk to the point of time here Carsten's brought it up what's your view on this the timeline when you see the rollout of these plant and cell based seafoods um, you know, can you ever see a time when they might replace 50% of conventional seafood, for example? Yeah, it's really hard to make that kind of prediction. Um, and I wish I did have those kinds of numbers um, on exactly when we thought that the market could be of a certain size, um, but it's just so new and there's so little history to look at. Um, but I do think that, you know, there's no reason to believe that this will be a fast um, growth or any faster than, um, you know, the sort of alternative meat more broadly, which has been kind of ahead of um, alternative seafood. And I think that timeline is an advantage. Um, and I think Karsten pointed out a few of the reasons why, where we can, you know, really make sure that this industry is serving the global population in a meaningful way um, and not uh, sort of displacing more accessible food um, and that we're really producing uh, products sustainably. So I think, you know, with this somewhat longer time frame, we're able to really uh, engage stakeholders um, and really refine processes right. and, and really get products to the nutritional profile um, that consumers are expecting from seafood. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. That's, that's an interesting response. Thank you for that. So thanks to the audience for your questions and to the panel for this interesting discussion. We're going to close, before we close, we now want to hear from Gareth Johnston, Director General Worldfish, with some closing remarks. Thank you, Gareth. Hi, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed today's thought-provoking discussion on the future of alternative seeds. Seafoods or, or, or aquatic foods are an essential part of healthy diets and the livelihoods of those working in aquatic food systems such as fisheries and aquaculture, most in low and middle income countries. As we heard from our panelists, the human appetite for aquatic foods shows very little sign of slowing down and with a growing global population, it's our challenge to come up with ways to meet this demand in more sustainable ways. We see innovations in fisheries and aquaculture, uh, which are making them more sustainable, inclusive and productive. And that's, that's the direction to go in. However, when we look at the future of our food systems, we must also examine emerging food technologies, including plant and cell based seafood. So diving into this future food frontier is, is pretty exciting. The possibilities of alternative seafoods are potentially infinite and we must explore ways they can be part of sustainable and equitable food systems transformation. They have the potential to provide food and nutrition in efficient, resourceful and climate smart ways. They also present a range of opportunities for crafted food systems like sustainable seaweed farming <clears throat> by creating a market for novel ingredients. As pointed out in the discussion today, Early research suggests in the near future, the emerging industry will make up less than 10% of the growing seafood market with little penetration in low and middle income countries. However, we shouldn't underestimate the reach and the growth of such new technologies. We need to be ready to answer some fundamental questions about who this food will benefit, how it will impact traditional aquatic food systems, uh, especially for those who rely on them most in low and middle income countries. Now, uh, last week, Wellfish Strategy uh, to 2030 was released and uh, has defined aquatic foods, uh, foods to include alternative seafoods and is dedicated to exploring their role in food systems that produce sustainable and healthy diets for all. That's why Wellfish is working with Dave Little and colleagues from Institute of Aquaculture at the University of Stirling and IFBRI to examine their potential in terms of economic, social and environmental impacts and looking at different developments and scenarios. This first study will be released next week, so do look out for that. Building on this work, we'll identify how the emerging industry's growth can be inclusive, environmentally friendly and contribute to sustainable development goals. Along with this, we also must forge dialogues with stakeholders, partnerships in both the conventional and alternative seafood sectors with research and development as well as government. 
Shaping a really strong research agenda on the emerging alternative seafood sector requires a variety of voices and diversity and a strong partnership for success. We invite you and those interested to get in touch with us to develop this further together. Wishing you all a wonderful day. Wherever you are, stay safe and healthy. Thanks very much and over to you, David. Thanks very much, Gareth. And uh, we move now just to a, 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 final, a final couple of comments from, from ourselves here. Um, thanks ever so much for joining. Um, uh, the panel members and you who have joined as participants, thanks for, for joining in our first of the Big Fish series. Our next seminar will be in February, February the 11th, led by David Love with John Hopkins University on COVID-19 impacts on seafood value chain. So watch out for that. Um, stay, stay safe and we hope to see you in the new year. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Dave. All the best. Thank you, everyone. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you.